Um, and also some comparisons with um, other frameworks, and uh, there's, a, there's been a little bit of competition in this space. And, and I would love, uh, I've also talked a little bit about those frameworks. And uh, yeah, I'll share some links about the community. So, all right, so yeah, this is just the outline that I was talking about. Um, so yeah, uh, what is RedWidgets? So RedWidgets is an opinionated, um, batteries included uh, JavaScript TypeScript framework that is really designed to keep you moving fast um, while not compromising um, the structure that you might need to grow up into a bigger company. Um, so how does it do that? Um, so before I talk into talk more about the architecture and like uh, how our group works, these three uh, points are super important because uh, this is this is this basically ties together everything about Gregory as I said as I go through the sort of spikes. Um, briefly, the architecture. Um, there, there's a lot of jargon here, but in a day, it's a full stack framework, meaning. It provides uh, constructs on the back end. It also provides constructs on the front end. It takes care of uh, integration between the back end and the front end. So on the front end side, you can see there's uh, React over there, and that's interacting from the browser. On the back end side, you can see there's mentions of GraphQL, which I'll talk about, um, even schema services, third party APIs, which everything I'll talk about. But um, the, the architecture, this is like one way of looking at the architecture, which is the core organization, I would say, which is you have an API side and a web side. So if you've worked with um, uh, you know, companies that have to deal with uh, different clients for the same API, you could also envision a different client, just like a web client. You could have a native client or an Android or an iOS client, all uh, talking to a unified API, API if you want that. You know, that is possible with web APIs. So I'll take another direction of this same architecture. It's a different layer kit here, where we're talking about this real uh, you know, vendor box of tools that RedWidJS puts together. Uh, it's not really reinventing a lot of things here. Um, it's writing on a lot of rails, which is the presentation layer, you've got React. And then uh, on the data transfer layer, you've got um, GraphQL and Apollo server. On the business logic layer, you have Prisma, which you know can talk to MongoDB and um, you know many relational databases. So, yeah. So uh, this is the basics of it, and, and I want to touch upon some of these things because I don't really know how many of you know more about these libraries. So we got ReactJS, which is a way to build uh, web uh, components. Uh, there's versions of ReactJS which would also let you build um, mobile components. Uh, but it's basically a UI library. Uh, GraphQL. Um, I think of GraphQL as a, uh, a data transfer layer, uh, which is uh, you, you, uh, it will basically um, provide you some constructs to query for data and then resolve that data. So as a client, you would be asking, you know, you'd be interacting with maybe many API services, and um, you know, it could it could be uh, data coming back in JSON, or it could be data coming back in um, gRPC, but uh, GraphQL gives you this really nice abstraction of being able to query in one way and then get the response back in one way, and um, being able to see and choose what um, data you actually want back from the server. Um, serverless is also uh, one of the trends, one of the frameworks that's been um, uh, trending recently. So it's, it's just this idea of uh, really not owning any servers, uh, right? So you take your uh, logic, you package it up to, into something called a function, a capital F function, and then you ship it to uh, environments like Cloudflare Workers or AWS Lambda or Netlify functions. Um, so this has been pretty famous recently, um, so that's also something that we'll talk about. Uh, Prisma. Prisma is basically an ORM, uh, if you have dealt with an ORM previously. So it's a way to interact with your database. Um, so you know you could do uh, queries, um, you could do any sort of crud uh, on your database. So it basically gives you this unified interface of like being able to talk to a Postgres database or a MySQL, MySQL database or a Mongo database with a unified API. Just uh, sorry, Pino, uh, which is just a login framework. Uh, just is a uh, testing. Um, framework that you could use both on the back end and the front end. Um, Storybook is a component catalog. So many times, uh, you know, as you're going through the uh, web development uh, 
you know, motions, the final thing you want to do is like you want to first isolate how um, you, you get a mock from the designer. You look at the mock, you want to recreate that mock uh, locally first, see how it actually looks before you um, you know start pouring data into it from the back end. So Storybook really lets you do that in an isolated way where you don't have to deal with the actual data. And um, Redwood actually provides a lot of uh, good ways to mock data into your storybooks where you really don't have to talk to any server and then in isolation really build your UI and then come back and build your uh, um, Penguin CSS and Chakra UI are just like a couple of libraries that are um, uh, that make it really easy for you to make uh, beautiful things on the web. Uh, they're just UI libraries. Um, you know, if you have used Bootstrap, it's pretty similar to that. Um, so these are what we're working with when we're talking about uh, Redwood JS. It's, there's no, uh, like I said, there's no reinvention of Google in, in any of this. It's just putting together a lot of things that just work. Um, uh, it also means uh, you will uh, you will see that a lot of short, shortcomings of these tools will be, you know, seeping into Redwood JS as well. So um, what I'm trying to do here is a little uh, workflow, uh, which is let's say you are tasked with uh, building this team page where you got a bunch of people uh, and, and some text. Um, let's say this is what you wanted to build. So I kind of wanted to just walk through this, uh, you know, really short uh, fabricate small isolated scenario and how would you how uh, you would go about doing this with Redwood JS. Um, so there's there, so I'm just going to dive right in here into like how you go about building that page. Um, so one command to create a Redwood app. Um, the moment you do it, um, you got a couple of things here. I'll go into the highlighted section soon. Um, now you want to generate a page for the team page that you just looked at. So you, there's a command for that. You do the Yarn Redwood generate page team, and then you do Yarn Redwood generate component team member for each of the uh, team members you're seeing here. So there's a lot going on here, so I'll stop briefly and explain what's going on. So the first command should be familiar if you work with Yarn Create. Um, you know, Yarn Create is a way to bootstrap any project. You could do that. You could do a Next.js project. You could do a Create React app with it. So it's the same thing. Um, when you do it, Yarn uh, Create Redwood app, you give it a name. It takes a cookie uh, cutter template and then basically spits out this, this folder structure. When you look at it, you see the first uh, up there, you got the API uh, site and you have the website. So basically, that's where you got all the, the API site is where you got all the server side logic. The website you where is where you got all the client side website logic. And then this is interesting because when you did yonder would generate page team, uh, there's a routes file uh, that's kind of this unified place where you can see all the routes that your app supports. And then you can see uh, a route was created for the team. And I didn't have to write that route, it was just created for me. Also, you can see that a team page was created for me. And I didn't have to create that, it was created for me. Uh, when I did young uh, G, which is the short term for generate, RW is the short term for um, Redwood, uh, component team number, a component was generated for me. So without doing much, I already have a bootstrap of a working app, um, a page that I want, and a component that I want, um, all, all ready to go. From here, I just go to navigate to team, if there's nothing there, but I see that. Um, what uh, I was talking about, storybook. So let's say you know we, we looked at the mock that we got, which is uh, basically this guy. We want to build something like that where you see an image, you know, a title and, uh, and the name. So we, we, we try to do that. And the, and the way um, I approach development and a lot of people approach development uh, is first start with the storybook because you know how the UI should look like. Uh, this is called the design driven development where uh, you just run this command, you have a good storybook that actually starts a storybook for you. You know, automatically, Populates the team page and the team member that were previously generated. Now uh, you can go to the team member stories and then you can add some data there and then you can do some minor tweaking uh, within the team member component. Um, I don't think the component itself is uh, in the screenshot here, but essentially 
the component itself is super simple. I just have a container for an image, uh, you know, install solid React um, a name, and then the role. And I pass in some data, I'm already seeing, you know, the data there. So the next step is, um, you know, it doesn't really look great. You just saw that, and you, you are going to actually make this look good. Uh, super simple. All you do is run your Android would set up your UI Tailwind, and that takes care of setting you, setting up your Tailwind config CSS, uh, the, the, the config file. Um, and you go back to that uh, storybook, and you, you, you look at Tailwind documentation, add a couple of um, classes that you need to add to your uh, team member component, and boom, you got this nice uh, team member component working already. So uh, you could do the same with Checker. So if you have Checker UI um, instead of Tailwind, you could do the same. Um, so that's all good, uh, but let's say uh, you have this requirement where um, you don't want it to be static. You don't want the list of members to be static. There's a requirement that uh, the, the, there's, there's so many members coming through uh, into the team and you want to make sure the team uh, page is loaded dynamically. The list of the members in the team page is loaded dynamically. How do you go about that? So as soon as you think about uh, you know being able to load something dynamically, you're thinking about databases, putting that in a database, um, you know, fetching that from a database. And that's exactly what we're doing here. So remember I showed you the API side um, right here? So in the API side, there is a API DB schema at Prisma. So if you are familiar with Prisma, um, Prisma uh, is, like I said, an ORM, but it has this uh, way of uh, declaring data uh, as models. Um, it's similar to Django in the way that you're not really defining the, the database tables, but you're defining a model in its own DSL. Um, when you define that, and similar to Django or any other um, full stack, not full stack, but like batteries and uh, packet frameworks, you run a migration, you, you have a migration ready for the new model that you just created. So I'm creating a new model here with an IE auto implemented, name, role, and image URL. So um, in this case, I already had my local Postgres running. So this database URL is being pulled from the environment. Um, it could be any, it could be any uh, databases across, you know, Postgres, MySQL, uh, MongoDB, MariaDB. Uh, I don't know if it supports, Cass supports Cassandra, but there is a bunch of uh, databases that Prism supports. So the moment I do this, I have my migration ready. So I just added this team member. And the next thing I have to worry about is, sure, I added the model, but how do I create, update, read, and delete my team members? All you gotta do is run Redwood G scaffold the model name. Once you do that, uh, Redwood picks up the model name. It actually creates uh, pages for you. Not just that, it actually creates all the logic required to create, update, read uh, lists, and then details, and also delete a team member. So if you navigate to this uh, team members um, page, the last one, uh, that, that look, looks like this, where if the UI is already there, it's all Redwood's um, admin UI, basically. So this should be very familiar to people who have done any Django using Django admin. It's very similar to that. Um, as you can see, you can click through, uh, edit things, delete things, and this is your admin board for that particular model. Um, so w w how did this happen, right? So how did this all work? Um, in the case of Django, um, a lot of that seemed magical, but in this case, it's a lot of generated files. So if you look at this thing, where you can see there's a lot of pages that were generated as part of the scaffold uh, command, but also there is an SDL file generated. What is SDL? SDL is just spec and definition language. It's, this is your contract. You're, you're saying that this is your contract with your client. So any client can only make these mutations or these queries on that particular model. So this is all generated for you. Sure, you have the contracts, but how are these contracts resolved? So that's the GraphQL resolvers, which are also generated for you. So 
uh, Redwood puts them in a, in a separate folder called services, which is an interesting abstraction to think about, right? Which is, if you've done, um, uh, if, you, if you subscribe to this idea of like, DAOs and rep uh, repositories and uh, you know services, uh, you, you kind of want to have the separation of like, hey, my DAOs could change or the underlying data model like starting to change, but my services could be the same and the, the interface they expose could be the same. Uh, Redwood subscribes to that uh, sort of mentality where um, it does give you this these uh, these folders where uh, these layers of um, core organization are separated. Um, but you can you can see how let's say if at some point you don't want the team members because maybe there are billions of them you don't want this to be serving through you know this Postgres database maybe you want to read it from um, DynamoDB or something you don't you don't have to worry about this contract you can go here instead of talking to the database um, directly you can talk to the third party API here but resolve the same data. So that's what um, uh, this sort of uh, you know SDL plus services uh, gives you. This sort of separation gives you, and Redwood offers that out of the box. So yeah, and the other thing is, um, in this case, uh, you know we, we've done uh, we've gone from like a static page of numbers to a dynamic list of numbers, but then we all we kind of need to put it all together. Where you know in that original D page that we were hoping to build. You know, we, we actually want uh, to see the members that we just added. So it, it's pretty simple. How uh, Redwood does it is using this uh, construct called cells. Uh, cells are just constructs of declarative uh, data fetching. So when you run that command, which is down Redwood uh, generate cell, team member this cell, it'll generate this file. But the, the thing to understand here is a couple of things, right? Uh, which is this query part. The loading part, empty part, failure, and success. So, this is really extremely tied to your query. Like, your UI is really tied to your query. So, this query is what you saw previously, which is the team members, um, which is up there. Um, so, that's the query, and you're saying these are the fields you want. So, what this is doing is, if that query is loading, this is what this number will render. If that query returns an empty list, this is what this company will render. If that query is a failure, this is what it will be rendered. If it's a success, this is what it will be rendered. So that's what, so it, it is actually abstracting away all of that if else um, jargon from you and creating, giving you this really declarative, um, simple way to abstract your data fetching and rendering into this construct called a cell. So, you know, once you generate a cell, you can also, again, like there is first class support for a storybook. So you can only see your uh, cells in your storybook. And here's the like, member of this cell. Uh, also, uh, for this particular uh, slide, the team page that we originally created where it was like empty team page, um, what happened here is this team uh, member list cell I just included that into the team page, and it immediately started showing uh, the data in, in, the, in the team page. Um, so again, uh, this is all uh, just you know getting data, getting dynamic data. But you know there will be a point where you have to add authentic authentication to your service. So how do you do that? I mean, usually when you think about authentication, there's definitely a lot of customizations you can think about, but most probably all you need is you know a login sign for your password and set password hey, these are the pages you need. So and Redwood supports that out of the box. All you have to do is just run those two commands and it'll generate the pages, it'll set up the authentication uh, and the handlers and everything that's required for you. Now what I'm doing here is DV authentication, which is you're hosting the tokens on, on your side or the hashed um, passwords on your side, but you could use of zero, you could use Superbase, you could use uh, Clerk, you could use Magic Links. It's all supported by Redwood um, and the commands are just instead of the you will be using the other names. Um, the interesting thing is when you do the uh, generation for authentication, 
you uh, you actually get this file, which is the uh, get current user file. This interface is actually shared across the back end and the front end, which is the interesting part, right? Because um, the get current user, you could uh, retrieve the current user from the session and add extra data to the user, like roles, the user has them. Um, this, again, these ease of indicator task role, they're all uh, shared across the client and, uh, server, which means if down the road, if I wanted to introduce our back to you know, my web service, I could easily, this is on the client side, I could easily call something like task role and then make sure uh, there's a logic render uh, authority. Um, the other thing is functions. Uh, just make sure I get enough time here. The other thing is functions. Um, so we talked about uh, services, which are basically abstractions of your business logic that um, lie within those services and service boundaries. But you could have situations where, let's say, you want to receive a web hook from uh, an external service, or um, you just want to call an external API and get that data. You could still do that. And you just you do that with uh, something called a function. So you generate a function, and it's a, it's a lambda um, function, as you can see, if you start with API gateway event. Uh, that's the event that it takes. But you could have any custom logic here. Um, you know, uh, webhooks is the most common use case I can think of here. Um, yeah, and the other thing is service caching. Uh, this is a very recent addition to Heroku uh, You know, we all come to a point where we could argue if caching is good or not, but um, there will be a point where you might have to cache some of the data. So it does provide a couple of constructs. You, when you do that, it will actually generate a file where you can configure the uh, the typing for caching. And once you have that, you could do these two constructs, which is cache find many, which uh, basically does a look up, uh, it basically looks up the first item and sees if the item has changed. If it did, it will automatically invalidate the cache and get you the list of items. If that first item did not change in a list, matching the conditions, um, it will just return stuff from the cache. Uh, so it will handle all of that for you. And the same thing here, um, you know, you can define your own uh, cache key. Uh, depending on what the data, and then it will, it will cache it, and it will just return the data, um, either from the upstream or from the cache. Um, yeah, so let's talk about deployment. Um, yeah, the deployment is super simple with RegulJS. You have multiple options. So you could go fully serverless, or you could go server full. Uh, the reason for that is, I think when RegulJS started, there was all this, um, you know, raise about serverless and how lambdas, you know, are going to be the next, you know, future. But I don't think there was a lot of investment into actually making lambdas or the cold start problem better. So they sort of slowly moved away from just being exclusively serverless to also supporting server full. Uh, so it, it supports all of these uh, deployment uh, environments. So you just do that and then and generate the required YAML files for you, and you sign up with that provider, and you should be able to deploy uh, pretty easily. Um, all right, so I'll just try to summarize. I know there's a lot of data. There's a few things that I did not cover here. There's some powerful constructs like directives and transforms that I did not even touch upon. Um, but like I said, it's a way of uh, uh framework with a lot of useful constructs and core organization and uh, a lot of stuff that is included that comes out of the box. Uh, but the drawbacks are, there is a steep learning curve. Um, personally for me, it took a long time to understand even some of these concepts and you know make them work together. Um, and I think they work for the 90% of the use case, but if you're trying to hack together the last 10% where you have a really custom um, authentication situation, you really have to dig into the code and understand and fix it, which, which could be fine for some people, but that's something to keep in mind. Um, GraphQL subscriptions are not supported yet, meaning if you have changes in the data, GraphQL subscriptions will let you listen to that data change on the client. That won't work yet. Union types, again, is a problem with GraphQL. It's still in RFC, meaning if I have, a, if I have uh, an API endpoint that can take a dog type or a cat type, right now I have to kind of go around um, using some hacks to make it take those two data types. It does not support that. Um, so again, these are some problems with GraphQL itself, but because Redwood uses it, it, it gets shipped into Redwood. 
SSR. So this might be a deal breaker for some people. Right now, uh, Redwood does not support server-side rendering. It's uh, fully client-side rendering, but you could say certain routes are pre-rendered, meaning they're built after, they're basically uh, rendered at the build time and shipped to HTML. Um, so they are, I think, working on it. Um, so we'll, we'll see them, but it's not supported at this point. The background worker story is not that great. Um, yes, there are functions, uh, but you know, if you want to run some cron jobs, and if you want to do sort of a fully evented system, there are tools out there that'll let you do it, and they're all uh, coming up right now. But in general, in a serverless um, first framework, the background worker story is not fully there. Um, and then, yeah, so there's some competition. Um, you know, Redwood JS is actually um, started by this guy, Tom, who actually is a co-founder of GitHub. Uh, he is the one who led Jekyll, and he also wrote Tomo, um, and Gravatar. So there is a good amount of funding and community around uh, Redwood JS, but there are other projects like Blips.js, which actually is built on top of Next.js. It just builds these extra functionalities but with Next.js as a you know as a, as a foundation, which could be good, good or bad because you're kind of tied tied to the, you know Next.js, and we'll see how that goes. Vast one is one of the things that I came across, which is it's actually a custom domain specific language that you could use to write web apps. I will spit out JavaScript that you could customize if you want. Uh, Retool is kind of a proprietary tool, but if your use case is very specific to an internal tool, Retool is the way to go. Super easy to set up data sources and you know uh, make uh, Excel like uh, you know CRUD apps and you know, go from there. Scrappy is also pretty good. It's it's more of a CMS, a headless CMS, um, but it does offer many of the things that Redwood.js offers. Um, this is the community. So uh, that's the website. So you know if you go to websites, it should be super clear. The documentation is probably some of the best documentation I've seen. It's really good. Uh, that's the GitHub link, and uh, that's the discourse community, which is pretty engaging all the time. And uh, this is the YouTube channel where they have some really top-notch um, content about RedwoodJS. And uh, they also host talks every uh, couple of weeks where there's people working in the serverless framework uh, world who are trying to build stuff for RedwoodJS, and uh, they come together and talk. It's pretty cool. And that's pretty much it. Questions?